Recently, I saw a video by YouTuber Omed Yashar, aka Yosef, a former Christian who converted to Orthodox Judaism. In this video, he responds to the following question. How is it possible that the Jewish people reject the uh, proof or evidence of Jesus being the Messiah when the New Testament reports that 500 and more people witnessed him after he had been resurrected? Her question comes from the fact that the Jewish people often refer back to the uh, massive amount of individuals who, who witnessed the revelation at Mount Sinai as part of the proof of the truth of the Torah that was given by God to Moses. The question has a great deal of merit, but it can be made even stronger. If we give secular historians the benefit of the doubt, what information can we glean about Jesus of Nazareth? I will go through three passages believed by the majority of New Testament historians to be historically authentic. First, Jesus' claim in Matthew 11. Jesus says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This passage is considered historically authentic because Jesus is claiming to be unknowable, yet the post Easter church taught that you can know Jesus. Therefore, this passage is very unlikely to have been fabricated. In this passage, Jesus is claiming to have a unique relationship to the Father, superior to all of humanity, and to be the only way to know the Father. Second, Jesus' parable of the tenants in the vineyard in Mark 12. In this parable, the landowner goes away on a long journey and leaves a group of tenants in charge. During the harvest, the owner sends a series of servants to collect payment, and each time, the wicked the tenants kill the servant. Finally, the owner sends his own son to collect payments, and the tenants kill him as well. The landowner represents God the Father, the servants represent the prophets of Israel, the son represents Jesus, and the land represents the land of Israel. The point of the parable is that because of the disobedience of the people of Israel, God would strip the land from the Jews and give it to the Gentiles, at least for a time. In this parable, Jesus portrays himself as superior to all the prophets. Third is Jesus saying in Matthew 24, But concerning that day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son but the Father only. Here, Jesus places himself in the position on an ascending scale. He sees himself as superior to humanity and even the angels in heaven. Historians consider this passage almost indisputably authentic. Because the church would not invent a passage where Jesus ascribes ignorance to himself, the knowledge being suppressed in the subconscious, Indeed, the manuscript evidence shows that many copyists tried to remove the phrase, nor the Son, from the passage. However, there is also strong evidence for the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. The passage recording the appearance of Jesus to more than 500 people at one time comes from 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians is one of the best attested books of the New Testament, considered by secular historians as authentically Pauline, and written around the year 56 of the Common Era. The passage I am about to quote, however, is considered even by atheists like Gerd Ludemann, a piece of a moral tradition that dates back to within five years of the crucifixion. Here it is. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Lastly, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Yosef's video response, far from answering the challenge, shows just how indefensible rabbinical Judaism is against evidential arguments. First, let's get the quick answers out of the way. Question, why is James not considered among the twelve? Answer, because it was a separate appearance to James, the brother of Jesus, who was not one of the twelve apostles. Question, why didn't Paul refer to this appearance of 500 when he preached to the people of Antioch in Acts chapter 13? Answer, he didn't need to. He made mention of Jesus' repeated appearances to many people over many days. The people of Antioch were convinced by Paul's teaching, and by the next Sabbath, huge crowds came to listen to the preaching of Paul and Barnabas. Question, couldn't an imposter have posed as the resurrected Jesus for the 500? Answer, conspiracy hypotheses like these, used to explain belief in Jesus' resurrection, have been universally rejected from the professional historical journals since the 18th century. The conspiracy hypothesis implies that the disciples suffered torture and died for something they knew firsthand to be a lie. Worse than that, the hypothesis is deeply anachronistic. The idea of a crucified messiah was as absurd to Second Temple Judaism as the idea of a married bachelor, and Jewish expectations of the day precluded anyone experiencing resurrection before the general resurrection at the end of the world. No one was expecting Jesus to come back from the dead. Question. Jesus wasn't the first fruits of the resurrection. Answer. The Tanakh teaches about the resurrection in Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 37, and Daniel 12. So I'm glad he affirms that God can raise the dead. 
However, resurrection is not merely the return of the soul to a lifeless body. The second temple belief in resurrection is stated well in Daniel 12 too. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Resurrection was defined as something that happens at the end of the age, when the dead will be brought back to life and transformed supernaturally into an immortal state, where they will then be judged by God. Therefore, it is incorrect to think of Lazarus and others who were raised from the dead as resurrected. A better term would be resuscitation. They were brought back to life, but in the same weak, frail, and mortal bodies in which they died, and they all died at a later date. Jesus was the first and only, so far, to be resurrected into the supernaturally powerful and immortal state predicted by Daniel. Hence, he is the first of the resurrected dead. Question: Didn't Jesus abolish the law, which would make him a false prophet under Deuteronomy 12? Answer: Jesus did not abolish the law. He reinterpreted it so that it became an internal moral guide. Even the rabbis agree that the law of Moses makes no sense unless it is interpreted. After the destruction of the Second Temple, the vast majority of the Mosaic commands simply could not be followed literally, and required reinterpretation in order to be followed. The only difference I have with Rabbinical Judaism is that I believe it is Jesus who has the ultimate authority over interpreting the Torah, and not the rabbis. Except for the last one, these types of questions betray a deep ignorance of the New Testament. An undergraduate in any decent seminary could have answered them. With that out of the way, we can get to the real heart of the issue, the Rabbinic Dismissal of Evidence. Historically, the rabbis have been somewhat paranoid of evidence that might undermine their claims to absolute authority over the Jewish people. No example better illustrates this than the Aknai Oven of Tractate Baba Metzia of the Talmud. It is taught on that day Reb Eliezer brought forth every imaginable argument, but the sages did not accept any of them. Finally, he said to them, If the halakha of religious law is in accordance with me, let the carob tree prove it. Sure enough, the carob tree immediately uprooted itself and moved 100 cubits, some say 400 cubits, from its place. No proof can be brought from the carob tree, they retorted. And then he said to them, if the halakha agrees with me, let the channel of water prove it. Sure enough, the channel of water flowed backward. No proof can be brought from the channel of water, they rejoined. Again he urged, if the halakha agrees with me, let the walls of the house of study prove it. Sure enough, the walls tilted as if to fall, but Rev. Joshua rebuked the walls, saying, when disputes of the wise are engaged in a halakhic dispute, what right have you to interfere? Hence, in deference to Rev. Joshua, they did not fall, and in deference to Rev. Eliezer, they did not resume their upright position but they are still standing aslant. Again, Rev. Eliezer said, If the halakha agrees with me, let it be proved from heaven. Sure enough, a divine voice cried out, Why do you dispute with Rev. Eliezer, in whom the halakha always agrees? Rev. Joshua stood up and protested, The Torah is not in heaven, Deuteronomy 30.12. We pay no attention to a divine voice, because long ago at Mount Sinai, you wrote in your Torah at Mount Sinai, After the majority, one must incline. Exodus 23.2. Besides the misquote of Exodus 23.2, which says, do not go with the majority, the deeper problem here is that the rabbis simply refuse to admit any evidence that clashes with their beliefs. God himself must submit to the will of the rabbis according to them. I actually agree with one atheist blogger when he said, one simply cannot presuppose the truths of disputable historical events prior to investigating whether or not those events took place and keep a straight face. It is hard to take someone seriously who holds a position on historical events and absolutely refuses to allow evidence to change his mind. The idea that the rabbis today have an uncorrupted and authoritative tradition that comes from Moses on Sinai is a historical claim and is subject to historical investigation and falsification. If you do not allow your views on this matter to be falsified by evidence, you risk delusion. You become like the man who went to the doctor believing he was a dead corpse. The doctor argued to the patient's satisfaction that the corpses have no pulse and cannot bleed. The doctor then pricked the finger of the man and blood came out. The man looked at the bleeding finger and concluded, hmm, I guess corpses can bleed. The man, like the rabbis, was not open to evidence. And what better evidence is there against the rabbinic tradition than the evidence for the radical self-image and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? If the rabbis were correct, then the last thing one would expect is for the God of Israel to resurrect from the dead a man who saw himself as the great divine judge of humanity he prophesied in Daniel 7. So again I ask, on what consistent basis can the rabbis accept the historicity of the Exodus while rejecting the historicity of the radical self-image and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? And I suggest if your religion cannot handle this evidence, that you get yourself a new religion. Shalom. Aleichem. And for further reading on the subject, The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright is a thorough scholarly work on the subject. Wright is one of the world's leading scholars in late Second Temple Judaism and provides a very detailed account on the people, culture, and idea of resurrection during that time period. Wright also does ground-clearing work, refuting every major alternative hypothesis to the resurrection.